matter to come before the court is Burkhart v. Yoder. Each side will have 15 minutes and the appellant may reserve up to five. Is the court ready? Yes, we're ready. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Attorney Dave Gerberod for Appellant Becky Yoder. I don't know how long my argument is going to be, so whatever is left over, we'll just reserve that if we could, please. May it please the court. As this court has said in the case of State v. McKinney, the critical inquiry, I'm sorry, in cases like this, domestic violence CPO cases, is whether a reasonable person would have been placed in fear of imminent, in the sense of unconditional, non-contingent, serious physical harm. Okay. In this case, we're presented with evidence that the respondent had taken a gun from the petitioner's nightstand. But we were never presented with any evidence that the respondent threatened the petitioner with the gun, brandished a gun, or even pointed it at the petitioner. Instead, she was found unconscious in the bathroom with the gun. Whether that may have been an incomplete attempt at suicide, fortunately we don't know that. We're going to have to find that out because she's still alive today. The next incident involved the petitioner's son calling the petitioner because the son found the respondent in the house, allegedly having broken in, but she was walking around with a drink in her hand. This is after the incident with the gun? The first incident was, yeah, she was found unconscious in the bathroom with a gun. Right. But again, there was no evidence that she pointed at the man or brandished it about or anything like that. All right. Going back to the in the house walking around with a drink, admittedly, this could be disturbing. But again, no evidence was presented that the respondent either threatened the petitioner or his son. Now, it's at this point in time that the respondent is told to stay away by the police. Prior to this, there's no court order or police instruction to stay away. Even after the incident involving the gun, there's nothing on the record or anything admonishing her from coming around. All right. And then after that gun incident in which the petitioner claims that he was afraid, he went to visit her at the hospital. You know, now that can be a controlled environment, but there have been incidences where people know about in news and TV where things can go awry at a hospital, too. All right. The next allegation allegedly involves derogatory postings on Facebook. Yet no claim is made that there were any threats in any of these postings or if there were threats that they were of an imminent or immediate nature. Instead, they're alleged to be derogatory. The next allegation was the respondent sent threatening texts and emails. Two points need to be made here. One, even if they were threatening, the threat was undefined, non-immediate, and prospective. But there was no reference to these being threats. Okay. When asked why the petitioner viewed these threats, these texts as threatening, he couldn't articulate any specific reason. And this is a direct response to a question from the magistrate. He did not articulate any reason why he thought these allegedly derogatory postings on email and or Facebook were threats. Well, was that something that the magistrate could have inferred from the language used? I think there was some language about you hurt me, now it's my turn. Yes, she did address that. She said, isn't this just evidence of a bad breakup? That's what she said. And the petitioner, again, didn't have any response to that. Specifically, she didn't. In fact, that was my next point I was going to make. In response from the questioning that these instances were evidence of a bad breakup, he didn't have a response to that. Okay. The petitioner also admitted that there had been no evidence of domestic violence between the two of these people in the past. I thought this was interesting. The petitioner, in response to a question from the magistrate, 
inquiring as to what he had done, what he had done differently in his daily schedule to resolve the issues of the text and the emails, said he took time out to worry about it. Nothing, he didn't explain why he was worried that she might show up. He didn't offer any evidence that he had taken remedial measures to prevent her from showing up. All he did was say he took time out to worry about it. As I said, this is pretty quick. So, at no point in time did the petitioner ever present any evidence that a reasonable person would be placed in fear of imminent in the sense of unconditional, non-contingent, serious physical harm. Counsel, the trial court made findings that um, after being instructed by the police to cease contact with the petitioner here, that she continued to contact and made the threatening um, text and Facebook posting. Well, actually, the word was derogatory text and Facebook, and yes, she did that. But again, that's the point I'm trying to make. There were no references to these being threats. It was more a reference to being derogatory. And again, that's when the magistrate followed up with her questioning, well, isn't this just evidence of a bad breakup? And he agreed well, with that. Well, no offense, but bad breakups end with people being killed. Sure, they can. And so I'm not sure what that means. Well, they can, and they can end up uh, just people having hard feelings and being mean to each other on Facebook. But if we're going to have a domestic violence CPO, it takes more than what could happen. There has to be some evidence of something actually physically happening that threatened this man's safety. And reason well, physically to believe happened or that he believed a reasonable person would believe would put them uh, in danger of possible uh, violence in the future. Imminent violence. Well, I agree, imminent. And I agree, there has to be a... There has to be a you don't have to wait for somebody to actually attack you. No, I agree, but then you can't speculate that they could either. There has to be something to make you believe and based upon the incidences we had, there was no evidence that he was ever threatened. And what would it can base that on for the belief that might happen in the future? What about when she threatens, re the, the trial court said, threatened revenge and continued her threats on text and Facebook after instructed her to cease contact with, with the police, instructed her to cease contact with the petitioner. And I think there the evidence was, as Judge Moore said, that she said, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you now. Right, again, I agree. It's perspective, though. Well, she doesn't say when, how, or at what point in time. It's like saying, if I were to say to somebody, well, sometime the next time I see him, I'm going to punch in the nose, but nobody knows when the next time I'm going to see that person is. And that's, how is that a threat if that never happens if I never see that person again? But she's already uh, broken into the home. Well, that's what was alleged, right? But again, that was prior to any reference from any court or the police that she should have stayed away. It was only after that incident, she supposed to be in the house, was walking around with a drink, that um, he, she was told by the police to stay away. So it, it would, it's not unusual, therefore, to expect that she thinks she could go back into that house, even with the incident with the, in the bathroom, since she had not been told by the police or he had not pursued any legal proceeding to keep her away. As far as she could interpret it, they still had a relationship. There was no evidence anywhere to well, prove that it ended. If she thought they had a relationship, why would she have to climb in through a broken screen? I don't know. Some people lock other people out when they're angry and mean. I mean, I know people that are still married that one person gets angry and locks the other person out of the house. I mean, it still happens. I just, I don't know. Unfortunately, I wasn't in that relationship. Was the evidence that the um, petitioner had told her that she had to move out and let home? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Was there it. evidence presented that the petitioner uh, said, "You're, you know, I know the broken relationship broke up, but did he say you're not welcome here at home?" Yet? I'm not aware of it. I reviewed the transcript. I didn't see that on the way over. I could have overlooked it. I don't think I saw that. Okay, so like I said, I'm done for the rest. I didn't know how long it was going to take. So That's all right. You have five minutes left. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this relationship uh, did end in June um, over um, personal issues with her, that uh, behaviors that I didn't really care about, um, things that made me nervous about her. Um, during
during the evening of the breakup, she, she did go to collect her belongings in my bedroom, um, took a loaded 45 caliber pistol from my nightstand, removed it from the holster, um, and locked herself in the bedroom. Me being extremely concerned for the safety of my child and myself, I immediately grabbed him, didn't even bother to put shoes on, got in, in my car and drove to the Montville Police Department. Um, called in, told they didn't have any officers on staff. They dispatched an officer to meet me at the police station. I explained to that officer what was going on, that I was concerned that she was in there, going to come out shooting. I had no idea what her condition was. I instructed the officer on how to get in, and unfortunately they found her on the floor having taken a whole bottle of Oxycontin and approximately 40 pills. Um, obviously I'm human. I had a relationship with this woman. Concerned that she was okay, going to be okay. This was very upsetting for me. Did go to the hospital the next day. Um, knew that that was a safe environment. She was in a hospital bed, barely able to walk from taking a whole bottle of Oxycontin. Just, are you okay? Kind of to settle things, we go about our separate ways. Um, really not much communication from there until all of a sudden she cuts the screen in the back door of my house while I was out playing a tennis match. Um, my son happened to be uh, enter the house and find her in the house and was just shocked by it, calls me immediately. I tell him to get out of the house. I called Montville Police again. They dispatched an officer. I raced home from uh, near Hudson to, to see what was going on and find out she's just walking around the house. Um, in addition to breaking into the house itself, she went and broke into my bedroom to get the dog out of the bedroom and she made herself a drink and was walking around the house and the officer said, you're not welcome here. Um, she said, well, I still have belongings here. She collected them and left. Um, at that point, I, I hadn't heard, and the officer instructed her that she's not to return. She will be charged with trespassing. Um, and, and then later, uh, a few weeks later, then these out of the blue, I started getting emails and text messages um, that were threatening and, you know, specifically saying that um, I want revenge. And to me, revenge means vengeance, means infliction of injury or harm. Um, clearly, you know, she's um, not going to keep herself from grabbing a weapon or something of that sort. I mean, I'm still fearful to this day that someone would actually do that. And as far as, you know, proof and everything that the magistrate is in the best position to judge the credibility of, of the witnesses, which, you know, when everything was occurring, I was in front of the magistrate explaining the same story. And, you know, according to um, the legal case in the Ninth District Summit Court 27527, the magistrate was in the best interest to preserve, in the best position to observe the demeanor of the witnesses, assess their credibility, and revolve any conflicts in the evidence. Oh, I have one question before we take your seat. Yes. Um, will we find anything in the record before the magistrate uh, where at any time after the breakup uh, you told um, the, um, she the respondent, you told the respondent that she was no longer welcome uh, at your home? Is that going to be any place in the record of the hearing? Or? I would have to review it a little further, but clearly she was told um, on several occasions by myself that the relationship is over and to stay away from my son, my daughter, and myself. Thank you. <coughs> hey, please support. <coughs> and I, if I misspeak here, I apologize, but I don't think you're going to find that. Okay, I, I read the transcript last night and I reread it this morning. All right. Um, the gun incident is unnerving because guns are potentially dangerous, especially if they're loaded. I understand that. But the mere presence of the gun doesn't mean that somebody's in danger unless somebody points the gun at somebody. The gun won't pick itself up and point itself at somebody. So what, I'm cons what I found interesting was that he said he was concerned for the safety because she was in the bathroom 
with a loaded gun and so you lock yourself in there. Now, I don't see how if the gun is in this room and the person with the gun is in this room and the door is locked, that the people who are outside are necessarily in danger from well, the gun when the person the is unconscious. The, the bullets can go through doors and walls. I would agree, except that she's unconscious. So she was found unconscious, locked in the bedroom, in the, in the bathroom with the gun. Well, she was found unconscious. Right. That doesn't mean that he knew at the time that, the, that she went in and locked the door, and he left that she was unconscious. Uh, okay, even so, if that's true, if he knew she was unconscious at the time when he locked the door, but I think he did, I think the evidence will show that. Um, Again, there was no overt act in furtherance of using the gun as a weapon. There was no overt act toward him. Okay. And again, Wouldn't that his ex, after she went into the bathroom and locked herself in there, be consistent with the idea that he was in fear? Would not his ex show the situation? His ex of gathering up his son and, or, um, and, and leaving? I would say, okay, that's the way he... He projected it in the way he acted. I don't necessarily agree that that's reasonable under the circumstances because of the distance between the person with the gun, the locked door, and the fact that they were unconscious. The door was locked. She locked it, right? That's correct. She it. Right, but by obviously locking it, she is trying to isolate herself from everybody else, too. She's not leaving it open at any given time. She could just come in and start shooting away. I think what this really suggests that that may have been a potential suicide attempt. Well, also maybe uh, relates to her instability. Could. You know, maybe mental instability. Yeah, that's well, possible, which is too. obviously a great concern in a lot of situations with somebody with a gun. It can be again, but I've been trying to focus on the gun not being able to do anything on its own if the person is in the car, in the bedroom, with the door closed, locked, and unconscious. I forgot to ask um, the athlete here, but about a criminal case. Do you know anything about that? Was there anything in the record about her being convicted of any criminal case? I'll, I'll, at this moment, I'm not aware of that, to be honest with you. It could be, but I don't recall. It's in the CPO. Mm -hmm. I don't recall. I really don't. Okay, so there's nothing on the record other than what's here, or you just don't know? I really don't okay, know. That's right. That's right. Well, obviously, we'll be reviewing the record. I just thought, since we're here, I can ask. Okay, so I'm going to try to wrap this up. Uh, there was no evidence of present harm ever presented. No evidence of any danger of future harm was presented, nor was any evidence that my client was controlling or threatening the, uh, controlling or threatening behavior, nor evidence of any prior domestic violence between the two parties. <clears throat> to get a domestic violence to CPO order, as this court has said in the case of MK versus JK, a petitioner must demonstrate that he was in danger of domestic violence. The petitioner never demonstrated he was in imminent danger of a person's physical harm. Instead, he speculated, engaged in conjecture. Well, it could have, this could have happened. I agree. The gun could have been a danger if somebody had pointed it at him. But the gun in and of itself is not going to shoot someone. Finally, it's totally inappropriate to use a domestic violence CPO to create a buffer zone around the petitioner and his children because this is what he repeatedly attempted to do. He repeatedly said he was fearful for his child's safety or his children. But yet he never seemed to have sought to have his son named as a protected person. You know, I think this is just a, an attempt to misuse a statute to augment or supplement a bad breakup. I think the parties have broken up. They're away from each other. They're not in communication, as far as I understand. And it doesn't justify finding a domestic violence or CPO. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you both for your presentation to the court. The court will take the matter under advisement. A written opinion will be prepared and sent to the parties, as well as it will be released on our website, the Supreme Court.